Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this very kind invitation. And I also want to congratulate them for their energy and endurance to conduct such an excellent international meeting during these adverse times. My task is to take atrial fibrillation to new limits. These are my disclosures. This is how we diagnose atrial fibrillation on a 12 lead standard ECG or on a 30 second rhythm strip. And this is our patient population consisting of about 44 million AF patients worldwide. So it's a true pandemic. And in comparison to another pandemic, which keeps our days busy, there are about 22 million active COVID-19 infections, but atrial fibrillation is not infectious, fortunately. The incidence of AF um, has been um, increasing worldwide over the past decades. And we know that when the population is aging, that there is also a um, exponential growth so that we will expect um, further increasing, increasing numbers um, in the next decades. The mechanism is well understood for the last uh, two decades, um, at least roughly, that there is the source, uh, the triggers coming from the pulmonary veins, and the substrate are the atria, the structure and the size, and micro-reentry circuits and multiple re-entry wavelets are forming. Uh, last year, there was a, a new edition of the ESC guidelines, uh, which were completely revised since uh, 2016. And the management, um, which is suggested in these guidelines, ABC of atrial fibrillation, first is focusing on avoiding stroke, which is, of course, of paramount importance, with oral anticoagulation and the NOAX being preferred over the vitamin K antagonists. The second column is focusing on better symptom control. There is rate control and there is rhythm control. Rhythm control, either catheter ablation or antiarrhythmic drugs. Um, there are various drugs uh, which are available for patients without structural heart disease. When there is um, reduced ejection fraction, there is only amiodarone left. The AFFIRM trial more than two decades ago tried to answer the question rate control versus rhythm control. And as we all know, it didn't show any, any um, statistically significant difference. So the discussion in these uh, last years the last almost 20 years was, um, should we really bother of doing rhythm control? We strongly believed in it as electrophysiologists and most cardiologists. But only last year, we really received the evidence from the EAST AF trial being published also in the New England Journal from uh, led by Paulus Kirchhoff. There were 2,800 patients randomized to early rhythm control uh, with drugs or ablation to rate control. And here there was a substantial significant benefit from the early rhythm control uh, resulting in 28% reduction of cardiovascular mortality, 35% reduction in stroke, which was both significant and 19% reduction in heart failure hospitalization. So the question is answered between rate control and rhythm control. What about medication and intervention? Uh, we know we have to focus with the ablation on the pulmonary veins. Uh, the cornerstone of AF ablation is the electrical isolation of pulmonary veins. The standard uh, therapy is radiofrequency ablation with a 3D mapping system. There's also cryoablation. Um, and here we have a pre-recorded CT or MRI image, and we can steer the catheter on this uh, CT map, so to speak, and isolate the veins. Um, this is a recent image of one of our patients. We have the ablation line. We stimulate from inside the vein and we check for complete isolation that the stimulus is not uh, reaching the atria. In the first years of uh, catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation, there was a substantial amount of uh, fluoroscopy being needed. Now we can do it purely without fluoroscopy with an intracardiac echo for the transeptal and the rest with a 3D um, uh, mapping tool. The Cabana trial um, has attracted a lot of attention. It was the largest um, catheter ablation trial ever, being randomized 2,200 subjects to ablation or drug therapy, a substantial amount of crossovers, and the um, outcome was neutral in the intention to treat analysis, which is the only proper way to interpret the study. Um, but it showed us that AF ablation has a very good safety profile and it's a very efficient therapy strategy for rhythm control. 
Um, in the last year, there were two ablation um, trials, the early AF trial and the stop AF trial, both uh, using cryoablation as initial therapy for atrial fibrillation. And these trials showed us that there were significant less AF recurrences in the first year after cryoablation as first-line therapy versus drug therapy, and it was safe. There was also a very low complication risk. Um, this study uh, investigated a heart failure patient, the Castle AF study, and this study uh, was uh, positive with ablation being clearly superior to uh, conventional treatment in patients with heart failure um, in terms of the hardest endpoint in all-cause mortality and the curves uh, diverging after three years. And this was implemented in the current guidelines with catheter ablation being a class one indication for patients with heart failure. Catheter ablation also class one after failed drug therapy. And it's also a treatment of first choice um, in the other patient groups with a class B indication. The third column for atrial fibrillation treatment is uh, focusing on comorbidities and cardiovascular risk factors, which has been maybe um, underestimated in previous years. There's a multitude of risk factors, some we uh, cannot uh, really um, influence and correct, and some we can clearly at least partially try to influence. We know obesity is a big problem in cardio for cardiovascular diseases, also for atrial fibrillation. This uh, Australian study looked at a combination of treatment uh, with catheter ablation and also risk factor management, including um, weight loss. And the patients with risk factor manage management had a um, significant better outcome for the AF ablation in terms of AF recurrence. What about the other extreme? What about um, endurance sports? We know that there's a U-shaped curve uh, with decreasing AF and then rising AF after an um, intense exercise of about 4,000 uh, lifetime hours. This has been shown for men, like most uh, findings in cardiology. For women, in a few uh, st female studies we have didn't show this u curve relationship. And this is also uh, reported in the ERA position paper, um, which is a pioneering work three years ago. Um, that there's the U-shaped curve of AF risk for men, but there is no, no such thing for female. So exercise reduces AF risk and uh, women can exercise as long as um, they have fun and as long as there are not other studies uh, showing us the opposite. The future, there are, uh, is a multitude of new technologies. Uh, I just want to briefly touch upon there is this artificial intelligence ECG algorithm, looking at sinus rhythm ECGs and trying to find the substrate of atrial fibrillation. So trying to diagnose at a sinus rhythm ECG atrial fibrillation. And uh, this in this study had a very good sensitivity and specificity. And there's also emerging technologies for new ablation sources. Um, the electroporation has first um, been shown at last year's HRS meetings, the first in human trial. Um, this pulse field ablation technology has a few um, advantages over our conventional treatment, like the radiofrequency and the cryoenergy. It's must, must much faster and it's much more specific. So the adjacent, adjacent structures like the esophagus and the phrenic nerves are not jeopardized as they can be with radiofrequency energy or with cryoablation. So in our efforts to cure, to um, ameliorate atrial fibrillation, we should have the patient in the center and uh, we have to collaborate with a lot of different disciplines. Uh, teamwork is key. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. Mm -hmm.